Welcome to UMBCast episode three. Today we will be interviewing Dr. Raul Pawar, a neuroradiologist from St. Barnabas Hospital. Thank you very much for speaking with us today, Dr. Pawar. We'd like to start off by asking, can you tell us a little bit about your path from being a college student to being the distinguished doctor that you are today? Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me. And um, it's an honor to speak to pre-med students since you guys are the future of medicine of the field. Um, the path from being a college student to becoming the distinguished physician that I am today. I'll take out distinguished. I'll just leave physician. So I've known since I was a, a child that I wanted to go into medicine. My, my parents are both in healthcare. My father is a cardiologist by training and my mother is a microbiologist. And when I was in third or fourth grade, if I recall correctly, my dad actually came to my elementary school. If you guys remember, I don't know if they don't really do those things anymore. My son's in fifth grade and it's not common uh, like it was in the, in the 1980s or maybe the 1990s, but my dad actually came to my elementary school and spoke to my class and had diagrams and models of the heart. And it's something that, um, growing up in a household where, where medicine um, was, was the norm. Um, I, was enamored of, I was enamored by it from a very young age because I just think it is, it is a wonderful profession where you can blend science and the humanities. And what I mean by that is there being a physician, a good physician is about understanding the science and being able to deliver quality care, which is more of an art. You have to have a certain aptitude for the, for the biology, for the chemistry, for the physiology, the anatomy, et cetera. But then being able to deliver quality care um, is actually the hard part. The hard part is not getting through the school and, and understanding the material. I'm not saying it's not difficult, but but being able to deliver care is, is, um, is the challenging part um, because every patient is different. Every clinical presentation of any disease or condition um, is slightly different from one patient to the next. So as far as becoming a, going into college, I'd gone into college um, as a pre-med and I went to Boston University. I started there in 1997, graduated in 2001. And BU is a very large school. So I remember how intimidating it was to show up to orientation as a quote unquote pre-med. And it seemed like there were 30,000 kids that were all pre-med. And I remember the pre-med dean getting up in front of all of us in a large auditorium and telling us something to the effect of there are hundreds of you before me right now and only a small percentage of you will ultimately go on to medical school. Now that's not necessarily because they don't get in, it's because people change direction. And that's not something that he didn't, that's not something he specified up front. So that's, that, as you can imagine, that's very intimidating. Um, but I think one of the most important things I can stress since the point of this podcast is to, is to actually encourage um, future physicians, uh, pre-meds like yourself, is to sort of remember something that I, my mom actually said to me. It's kind of like the horses in Central Park. Um, or any, you know, city where they have horse rides, um, horses often have those blinders on. I think you have to remember that in life, no matter what you're trying to achieve, there are going to be plenty of people around you that want to achieve the same thing. Um, they may or may not be your competition in reality. It doesn't change the fact that it can feel that um, everyone's vying for the same spot and spots are limited but you have to keep those blinders on. You have to keep doing what you're doing. Periodically, you take them off and you, you look around, you see what others are doing. So you sort of have an idea of whether you should be doing more um, or you're in good shoes, you're in good standing. Um, you can learn from others, but you have to kind of keep those blinders on because it's a very long road and there's nothing worse than falling off the wagon or losing direction um, out of the fear that others are surpassing you, or it's very quote unquote competitive, or getting caught up in the statistics of only a small percentage of you guys are gonna ultimately get into medical school. 
those things really don't accomplish much. Maybe they're true in some nebulous statistical sense, but life isn't just about statistics. Um, you, you really have to stay the course if that's what you wanna do. And maybe you don't go about it in a straight line from point A to point B. I would argue that most successful people, be it medicine, be it business, finance, entre entrepreneurship especially, um, understand that success, um, achieving success, um, whatever that may mean for that given individual, is a zigzag pattern. You might change direction, you might take a detour. Um, in medical school, my roommate, one of my roommates who's now a successful gastroenterologist, endoscopist, um, that's now uh, has a faculty position in Florida. When I was in medical school, he and I were roommates. He was the president of our class. He was actually, I was 23 years old. And I think he was, if I'm not mistaken, a cool 10 years older than me. He was in his thirties already. And when we first met, he told me an interesting story. And bottom line is he went to, he went to school in Massachusetts, undergrad, did so-so, certainly not good enough to get into medical school off the bat wasn't even pre-med, ended up volunteering um, you know, as a lifeguard and ran into a physician who was an anesthesiologist, if I'm not mistaken, at Mass General. And, um, and basically told this, this they, they struck up conversation and he told my, he told my friend, my roommate, that um, if he really wanted to go to medical school, if that was his interest, which at that point he, he, was, he, was, he was interested, um, he didn't have to worry about the fact that he didn't have good grades in college. He could do a post back program. He could, he could kill it. He could do really well. He could apply to medical school, take his MCATs and, and take it from there. And that's exactly what he did. And myself, I had gone straight from high school to college, no breaks, straight to medical school and to residency. So I was pretty young when I started, pretty young when I graduated. But here was my roommate who was 10 years older than me. And it was one of the first times that I actually realized that that one need not go directly to medical school or to grad school or to law school. There's so many different circuitous paths and he just took a different path. And I, the reason why I give that example is because it can be very daunting applying to medical school thinking, oh, if I don't get in the first time, what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. Sure, it's disappointing, but there's, there's, there's multiple paths you can take. So that's not where I'm trying to go. What I'm trying to just, you know, just sort of put forth before I say anything else is that my path is not necessarily the only path. It's certainly not the only path, but I went to college. Um, I was pre-med and took the standard pre-med curriculum courses. Obviously, those are just a handful of core courses. Took a lot of other interesting classes as well and did a lot of research. Um, I actually had the opportunity to work with a pretty famous urologist in the world of academic medicine that founded, um, believe it or not, the drug Viagra, or at least deduced in, um, in the late 90s that the drug, which is now known as quote-unquote Viagra, uh, sildenafil citrate, could be used for erectile dysfunction. Well, it turns out that drug was not initially used for erectile dysfunction. If I'm not mistaken, it was used for pulmonary arterial hypertension. It was meant, it was, it was a drug meant to vasodilate the pulmonary arteries. Um, and one of the side effects was, um, turned out to be it's, uh, it's, more, it's more famous use. Um, I had the chance to work with, with the principal investigator of that drug at the Boston University School of Medicine. Now at that time, I had no interest in urology. As a matter of fact, I went to medical school, I went to college thinking, oh, I'll, I'll probably follow my dad's footsteps and become a cardiologist. Well, one of the things that I think I can stress to you, and I'll try to make these points throughout the conversation is sort of, I guess, if you can highlight in the air what I'm saying, it's this. Even if the experience that you might stumble upon is not necessarily the experience that you want, it's still experience nonetheless. And take it. If you have choices, choose between those choices, but sometimes you're not gonna have the choice and you're gonna get an opportunity um, where you can learn a tremendous amount and you should take it because you will learn things from those experiences which you can then transfer to areas of, of interest that you might have personally. Um, doing urology research with this particular physician and his staff, I learned how to gather data. 
I learned how to talk to patients about very uncomfortable um, personal conditions um, and so forth as an undergrad. And I poured my heart and soul into it. And, you know, did I develop an interest in neurology at that point? Sure, out of curiosity, it was interesting. I was learning a lot. Um, I ultimately did not become a, uro a urologist. I'm a neuroradiologist. Um, quite far from, from urology, but it was a phenomenal experience and I learned how to conduct basic research, which helped me in medical school um, partake in research projects and sort of hit the ground running. Um, and I think that's, that's probably one of my most important takeaways from college. You know, aside from you know, being members of some clubs and you know, enjoying myself and working hard in the usual college experience, um, which you should definitely enjoy, um, Use that time frame. Use the time frame in college to to, to broaden your experiences, and um, and in medical school you will ultimately become more focused as time goes on, as you get more exposed to the different fields. Um, in medical school, I started out with an interest in cardiology, then cardiothoracic surgery. My first, I should say, advisor, if you will, was a cardiothoracic surgeon, a preeminent cardiothoracic surgeon um, who taught me the physical exam. And uh, a, a wonderful guy, uh, a, a, just a great clinician, a great surgeon, and knew how to talk to patients, somebody that I wanted to be, emulate, et cetera. It, it, so he was sort of guiding light my initial years in medical school. Um, and and I remember, and I found myself over the course of my first and second year, finding other subjects interesting, and that can be that can be kind of challenging personally uh, for some people. I remember in medical school, I had some classmates that were diehard. I want to be an orthopedic surgeon, or diehard. I'm going to be a psychiatrist or a surgeon. As a matter of fact, speaking of surgery, a lot of people go to medical school thinking they want to become surgeons. And I remember when I was a third year, I want to say at least half the class wanted to be surgeons. Um, Surgery is a noble profession. It's very demanding physically um, and therefore emotionally, um, but, um, but only but a, a, a much smaller percentage ultimately went on to surgical fields. Um, and that's not because they couldn't handle it per se, but just because they developed other interests. I think it's important to have an open mind. You can have things that you enjoy. You can have fields that you think you might, uh, that you gravitate towards, but in the back of your mind, um, know that it's possible you might change course. Changing course is, is totally normal. And by the time I, I finished my third year of medical school, um, and just as a recap, the first two years, now this is, a, uh, this is a, a, an average of most medical schools. Every medical school is slightly different, but, but when I was in medical school, the first two years were uh, mostly classroom learning with some exposure to the, clinic, to the clinical side of things, maybe once a week, a few times a month, et cetera. But, you really have to digest a lot of academic information before you can hit the wards as a third year. Third year is when you do your, what are they called, the clerkships, 12 weeks of medicine, 12 weeks of surgery, six weeks of obstetrics, six weeks of pediatrics, et cetera. You really get to go through all those, uh, those fields, immerse yourself. And fourth year is more of the same, but you can specialize a little bit more and you can, you can do rotations in what interests you. Um, it wasn't until my third year that I realized I wanted to be a radiologist. And I can go on forever about this, but radiology really is, um, is an extremely broad field um, if looked at as a whole, right? Modern medicine wouldn't be where it is today without radiology, without imaging, because the physical exam, the clinical history, the review of systems of any given patient can only take you so far. We need imaging to be able to see what's happening inside the body. And to be an effective radiologist, I'm not even talking about a specialist like myself, but to be an effective radiologist first, you really need to have a thorough understanding of the entire human body, the anatomy, the physiology, the, phys the biology of disease, understand what normal looks like what an and what abnormal looks like. And I found myself in medical school actually enjoying pretty much all specialties. I liked psychiatry. I liked cardiology. I liked peds. I liked OB. I thought all of them were pretty fun. I became actually pretty confused towards the, the middle of my third year. And I found myself on my surgical rotations, actually, and medicine rotations, going down to radiology with my team, rounding, and looking at patients' chest x-rays, CAT scans, MRIs, and, and just finding, just finding um, 
uh, amazing how the radiologists could be looking at images of the body and explain to us what's going on with our patients and had such a firm grasp on the minutia of, of human anatomy and what disease looks like in multiple planes. Um, radiologists, in short, could be considered the doctor's doctors, right? Um, they're like the consultants, the high-level consultants. Um, maybe they're not the ones necessarily speaking to the patients and to the families, you know, on a daily basis, like a surgeon would or, or a pediatrician would or a family practitioner would, but they often provide the answers or at least can limit um, the number of answers of what could be going on with the patient down to something that's tenable um, and the clinicians can go from there. I just found that, I just found that, um, I just found that very engaging and ultimately that's what I, that's why I chose radiology. And I, I, in my fourth year, I spent more time doing, doing um, radiology rotations um, and, and spending more time with the radiologist and really getting a chance to, to understand how the field works. And, and that's what I did. I went into radiology and, and the rest is history. In my, during my radiology residency, I was interested in pursuing various different uh, subspecialties, interventional radiology, which is the use of catheters to perform procedures on patients, vascular, um, gallbladder related, um, uh, even neurointerventional for the brain. Um, for a while, I thought about doing orthopedic radiology, which we refer to as MSK or musculoskeletal radiology, which is imaging of the joints. Um, I found neuroradiology very challenging because anatomy of the brain and the spinal cord can be very complicated. As a matter of fact, I remember one of my professors to this day still teases me that I said in the very beginning of residency, I will probably go into any field of radiology excepting neuro because neuro is just way too complicated. Lo and behold, in my third year of residency, I decided to pursue neuroradiology because I felt that it would keep me challenged for the rest of my career. Ultimately, it was something that I, I, I fell in love with as a field. I love learning about neuroanatomy, neuroscience, um, specifically neuroradiology, imaging of the brain in various conditions. and here I am today. Long-winded answer, but but that's uh, if if I could stress my initial point that it's even though my path was pretty straight, uh, my the ultimate uh, the uh, ending up a neuroradiologist was not a straight line in terms of wanting to be a neuroradiologist since I was nine years old. I wanted to be everything else under the sun until I ultimately became a neuroradiologist. And I love my career choice. I, I, I enjoy it every day. And, and that's, 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 that's something that I'd like to, that, that, I, that I hope I can stress. You will change your mind. Maybe you won't, but if you do, that's great. And, and, and ultimately that's, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll hopefully find what you want to do. Well, thank you for that great background as to what led you to where you are today. Um, so just a quick question about, you were talking about like your residency. I know radiology is a very competitive residency nowadays. Did you feel that you had to do anything different to get that residency that you wanted? Or do you think that if you just went on any normal path, you could end up with that residency? Great question. So different specialties, depending on the time frame, meaning the time in history, I should say, um, can be, can be, very competitive um, or not so competitive, um, it really depends. And even if you're, you're choosing, um, I should say, a less competitive, and when I say competitive, I mean there's just a limited number of slots um, in the country on any given year for, for a particular specialty. Um, it's not that any one specialty is better than another specialty. It's just, it's, sometimes it's just a matter of how many places, how many slots there are. Um, which is ultimately what makes things competitive, right? Um, um, the, the amount of interest in any given year from medical students to go into any particular field is what determines how competitive it is. At, uh, I was in medical school from 2001 to 2005. So I applied in 2003, 2004, ar around that time. Now, at that time, the early 2000s, radiology was insanely competitive. The truth of the matter is, um, and I'm quoting the program director of the radiology department at my medical school at the time, um, 
basically, if you weren't if you weren't near the top of your class in medical school, or if you didn't do very well on the first step of the United States licensing examination, the USMLE, that's the acronym, um, the abbreviation, the USMLE step one, which effectively is, if you will, the first part of the licensing examination. Things have changed over the years, but it's three parts. You took the first part um, in the second year of your medical school before you became a third year. You took the second part, I believe, at the end of medical school or the first year of your residency. And you took the third part at some point during your residency. Um, and that has nothing to do with your specialty. That's to become a licensed physician to practice medicine or surgery in the United States of America. Um, for better or for worse, the score on that first step um, was critical. Um, to this day, it's actually fairly critical, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that score, along with your grades and things like research, more or less determined how competitive you were if you were if you uh, for a given specialty. Radiology at the time, now we're talking the early 2000s. Um, we live in a world of we're on the what I don't know 12th or 13th iPhone iteration of the iPhone. We're on a, a Zoom call doing a podcast in the early 2000s. If I remember correctly, I think I was using, I don't even know, I think I was using one of those old school Nokia phones, um, alphanumeric, all doctors still carry pagers. Cell phones were not the norm. Um, I received my first email address that I ever used in college, um, my .bu.edu address. So it was the, it was the nascency of the, of the the digital and technological boom as we know it. And as a result, radiology was also um, on the cusp of becoming the modern field that it is today. Um, and at that time they were doing MRIs, but you know, not, not nearly as many. Now at my outpatient center where I'm in practice, um, we can scan up to 80 patients a day on five different magnets. And that's a lot. When I, even when I was in residency, um, at my institution, we, we didn't scan more than 15 or 20 patients in a day. So the workload has exploded and the technology has enabled us to image patients faster and faster and faster. So, and now go back to the early 2000s, uh, radiology was super competitive, largely because it was one of the, the fields in medicine, which was really technology driven. And it's a clean profession, um, meaning my wife is an emergency room physician and on any given night of the week, she can go in and she can come home. She could be you know, covered in all kinds of dirt, grime, bodily fluids, you name it. Radiology tends to be a bit of a cleaner profession. I'm not saying there aren't procedures that we do where we can get dirty ourselves but, um, uh, and still see patients, but it's a cleaner profession. It became, it, it became known, again, for better or for worse, as a lifestyle profession. It's not that way. It's actually a grind. It's a tough job. Um, but for, for, a lot of, for a lot of different reasons, radiology was extremely competitive, and it still is. Um, so doing well in school, um, doing well on that USMLE step one, which I did, and continuing in research, um, was 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 of paramount importance for me to, to to get into radiology, to get accepted into to match into a radiology program. Thank you. Um, Sapir and I each have one question. Uh, we'll both ask mm -hmm. them. My first question is: um, Is there any type of scan that you specialize in? Like, do you look at all scans, MRI, CAT scan, CT, or is it one thing that you specialize in? And Sapir had a question. Um, and then you had mentioned earlier that you, um, specifically in your third year of residency, you went through all kinds of experiences. Um, what would you say is a defining moment of your career? Like which experience specifically, or a moment that reminded you why you went into medicine in the first place? Okay, so the first question is what do I specialize in? Do I specialize in a modality? MRI or CT or X-ray. Um, so a radiologist effectively reads all modalities. As a neuroradiologist, I specialize in imaging diseases of the brain and spine. And yes, we do use X-rays. 
but imaging of the brain and spine is primarily CT and MRI, computed, uh, computed tomography and magnetic resonance imaging. The most specific and advanced way to image the brain is with MRI. And within MRI, there are different kinds of imaging studies that we can do, um, which are even more advanced. For your sophomores right now, but I'm not sure in college when you take organic chemistry, but if you're familiar with NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, um, where you can analyze the key organic constituents of a given, of a given compound, um, we use similar things in MRI, uh, specifically uh, what I'm referring to is MR spectroscopy, where we can image the brain, identify a brain tumor, and apply MR spectroscopy, um, which in short will help us identify key amino acids uh, or compounds in, in a given mass or a tumor or a lesion in the brain, and we can help categorize it as benign or malignant. And if it's malignant, is it is it low grade or is it high grade? We can help stratify or prognostify a patient's condition. Um, and that is a direct application of nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR, which you guys learn or will learn in organic chemistry. Um, and and as, a radio, as a neuroradiologist, I read all modalities. I don't just read neuro. In my practice, I actually read other, other parts of the body as well. I read PET scans for cancer screening, for, for cancer evaluation, which is oncology, oncologic imaging. I read imaging of the joints. I do orthopedic radiology as well. I can be a general radiologist. I actually enjoy being a general radiologist as well because again, I went into radiology because I enjoy imaging of the entire body. I happen to specialize in neuro and had extra training in neuro, which is my fellowship. And I'm one of only three neuroradiologists in my practice. That being said, I do other things, but we don't typically focus on one modality. We may focus on one organ system, neuro or musculoskeletal, um, but, but I, I read all modalities. And, and, and being an effective radiologist, you really need to be, in the modern world, you really need to be effective. Uh, you really need to be well-versed in all the modalities. 20, 25 years ago, slightly different story. There are some older radiologists, I'm 41, um, there are radiologists that are in their 60s that are, do not know how to read MRI because they trained at a time and practiced at a time when MRI was, had not yet been invented and, or was brand new. Um, and it's very cumbersome to learn something like that uh, when you've been in practice. So some of the older radiologists, um, as they're retiring, um, may not be as well versed with modern imaging techniques, but any modern radiologist um, will be well versed in these things. Um, I hope that answers the first question. Yeah, um, we're, we are actually, uh, we know uh, NMR spectrum is a little too well. All three of us just took Orgo one. So, uh, <laughs> right. Yeah, we, we hear you. That's cool. Thank you. Well, speaking of Orgo one, and you know, this is an aside, but you know, oftentimes we learn my son is in fifth grade and, um, you know, he's multiplying fractions and, you know, learning about, you know, world history and learning how to use punctuation, you know, things of that nature. And sometimes people don't enjoy what they're learning in school, whether you're a second year in college doing OCHEM or you're a fifth grader multiplying fractions. And by the way, I can't multiply fractions anymore. My wife does it for him. She helps, she helps him. I have no idea how to multiply fractions. That being said, you, all of everything that we learn, even if they don't seem like they have a direct application to our lives, to our professions, um, they help us to think critically. It teaches us to learn complicated information so we can process it, understand it. It increases our, our ability to digest information. Um, again, uh, think critically. And, and believe it or not, many of the things that you're learning in college are going to help you if you ultimately go on to medical school. Uh, and, and nuclear magnetic resonance is something that I had no idea when I was 18, 19 years old, taking OCHEM like, the, like you guys are right now, you know, slamming the books hard in the library, Friday nights till 11 o'clock at night, seventh cup of coffee, trying to figure out, you know, cyclohexane and this, that, and the other thing. 
I would have never guessed. Um, fast forward 15 years, I'd be using MR spectroscopy to analyze brain tumors. Um, and I think that's something that I could, I could stress to you guys as well, right? It's, I think one of the benefit of these things like podcasts, which is why I'm so happy to do this, is that it's kind of a time machine. If I had, um, if I had the ability, the ease at which you three as college students can speak to me, we could set this up. Uh, we didn't have, it wasn't, this wasn't so easy to do um, not too long ago. Um, that perspective is important. So for what it's worth, as many college students that are out there that are, that are gonna eventually listen to this or hopefully listen to this, believe me when I tell you this, maybe not everything you learn in college in your science classes um, is going to have relevance to your career one day, but many things will. So learn everything as, as, as well as you can the first time around. And even if you may never use it ever again, if it does come up, of course, you'll have to refresh, but it will be helpful. It will increase your ability. It'll just, it'll increase your ability to, to learn new information um, and, and develop them all, uh, upon what you've learned in the past. Um, it all came back, believe it or not, pretty quickly when I first learned spectroscopy. Um, so, so yeah, I, ho I hope that answers that first question. The second question, Sapir, um, you, you asked, uh, let me just get this straight. What was a sentinel event, if you will, during my third year of, of, re of medical school, I think you meant, not residency, my third year of medical school, going through the clerkships where I realized uh, this is what I wanted to do? Yeah, exactly. Just like a defining moment of your career that like you realize, wow, like I really, I love what I'm doing. Like I'm meant to be here. Just something like special that sticks out in your head. You know, I don't, I don't, you know, it's, it's been so long. I don't, I don't think about it like that anymore. I, I wish I could. I'm glad this is an interview that's sort of off the cuff because I can give you more honest answers as opposed to prefabricated answers, which just sound good. I will tell you that, I will tell you that during my rotations, um, during all of medical school, really, I mean, it goes back to even being a first year medical student uh, taking anatomy uh, when we were assigned to our cadaver, um, walking to the anatomy lab and which was cold, um, dry. Um, there's a very, very unique smell to uh, a room full of cadavers hard to explain, but when you get there, you know it. Um, you don't really lose that smell. When you go to restaurants, when you're eating foods, it's kind of on your clothes, it's in your hair. You could shower all you want, but it's there, but it's a pretty powerful experience. Um, I think even as early in my first year of medical school um, in dissection, um, I realized how powerful it was to be a physician. Um, I remember, you know, I wasn't particularly um, grossed out, you know, I don't think anybody in medical school is really grossed out by, by a cadaver. Um, I'd hope not at least, but, um, it's just powerful to be standing there with your classmates in a small group, dissecting a human body, um, section by section and realizing that this was a person, a living, breathing person, lived a life, was a kid, was a young adult, maybe in college, maybe pre-med, um, who knows? Could have been a pro, a professional athlete, a banker, a father, a mother, a grandfather, a son, whatever. Um, and realizing this is a human being that dedicated their bodies post-mortem um, for the benefit of, of medicine, of physicians to learn from them of what the human body consists of um, beneath the skin. And I think that just, those kinds of experiences. Um, it's not necessarily like a, an, a, an epiphany, like, oh my God, this is why I'm here. It's more of a, just a sort of a, a, daily, a daily state of being in awe, um, of being there and realizing the gravity of what you're learning and looking around you and seeing that, oh, I'm in a class of only 150 in one medical school. There's only, you know, I don't know, however, several, maybe a couple hundred medical schools in the United States. Um, it's a really small group of people that are that have the privilege, the, the privilege of doing something like this. Um, and and you don't really take that for granted. I didn't take that for granted. I really enjoyed it. Um, I think in my third year of medical school, in terms of in in terms of uh, 
in terms of going through the clerkships, whether it be delivering a baby or, um, you know, sitting with an old lady on my family practice rotation, you know, who's telling me all about her life and, and, and stories and while she's talking about her life and, you know, the story of her life, you know, taking inventory of what medication she's on because she's a diabetic and is hypertensive, et cetera. Just going through all those experiences, you just realize how many people that you can touch as a physician. Um, and sometimes it's not even about just the medicine or just taking care of someone's blood pressure or glaucoma or broken leg. Um, everyone's, every, every, all of us are in this together, right? Dust to dust. And being a physician is a really powerful thing. People, people tell things, people explain themselves to you. They, they reveal their secrets with you. They, they tell you about their lives. And it's a really powerful thing. It's something that should never be taken for granted. It's something that's really a privilege. It's an honor. Um, and most, I would hope all physicians never take advantage of it, especially to give a sensitive nature of these things. I think that's just something, there wasn't an epiphany per se. I, I think I just, I really enjoyed, I, I was just happy to be there um, is, is the way I look at it. I, I, I never once doubted, did I wanna be a physician, did I wanna be here? I knew, I knew it was special from, from, from day one in medical school and I treated it as such. So going off of how you're talking about like how much you love your job and everything, are, are there ever times where you feel burnt out or maybe bored of seeing, I mean, I feel like this may not happen to you as much as some other um, pra like specialties, but like seeing the same few illnesses all the time, are there ever any times that you've had like that? So that's a great question. Am I ever bored? Am I ever bored? The answer is no, because it's challenging. Does it become easier? Are things, are certain conditions, are certain, are certain um, elements of my job a little bit more routine? Yes, I've been in practice now for 10 years um, after residency um, and I practice medicine full time. So while every day can be a challenge, not every day is necessarily a challenge because as we say in medicine, many conditions that we see are bread and butter, meaning I'm a neuroradiologist. I work at a, at a big stroke center and St. Barnabas Medical Center in Livingston, New Jersey is, a, is, is a, 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 one of the largest stroke centers in the state. Um, like I said, as I'm one of three neuroradiologists. I see when I'm reading brain MRIs in any given week, um, I've seen the full gamut of what a stroke can look like. And while some cases can be more challenging than others, um, with experience, it becomes easier. You develop more confidence. Um, and it's not, um, it's not that it's not challenging. You just, you just become better and better um, at, at, at making diagnoses, taking care of patients. Um, and I think my wife would say the same. She's an ER doctor. Anybody can walk in. She has nights which are brutal where every patient she takes care of um, has a difficult situation, right? We often have a saying in medicine, patients don't read the books. It's not like they come in with a particular condition. They have a checklist and they're like, yep, I've got this, 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 and this. And we're like, yep, matches perfectly with this particular diagnosis. You are set. Take three of these and call me tomorrow. It's, it's, not, it's not like that. Uh, it's far from it, in fact. Um, so I think the challenge of medicine is the fact that, uh, I'd say, I think most physicians would agree with me on this. The challenge of medicine is not necessarily, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, the more, the more complicated esoteric or rare conditions, but more so the fact that common conditions can have very atypical presentations. And in this pandemic, we're seeing something like COVID, um, COVID can manifest there are some common manifestations of COVID. There are some very uncommon manifestations of COVID. There are some patients who are walking around who are completely asymptomatic with COVID, which is one of the reasons why we're in this situation in the first place. So um, that perfectly illustrates my point that dealing with patients, understanding disease um, can be very tricky because not everybody presents the same way. Um, and on imaging, not all tumors look the same way. Not all strokes look the same way. So the challenge is, being able to recognize common things that have atypical presentations. And therein lies the challenge and the fun of it all. Um, I'm never bored of work. 
Um, I know I, I can't, I can't, I'm not going to sit here and, and talk negatively about other professions, but um, I certainly do not wake up uh, on Monday morning, think to myself, another boring week. You know, it doesn't matter. Um, I, I, have, I have friends who are in various different fields that are handsomely compensated for what they do, live great lives, um, but they're certainly not looking forward to uh, their work week. Um, and uh, I think as a position, if you choose the right field for you, I think that's also very important. That's another discussion, but choosing the right field is important. Um, if you don't wanna be a surgeon and you're forced to do surgery every day, you're gonna hate your life. If you don't wanna sit in a room and read images all day, you're gonna hate your life if you become a radiologist, no matter how much money you make. So you really have to choose the right field. You're happiest when you're choosing, when you choose the field that engages you the most. Um, time flies by, you're not looking at the clock. It's not like watching paint dry or grass grow if you, if you really enjoy what you're doing. Um, as far as answering the question of have I ever felt burnt out? Um, I think burnout is a very complicated topic. Burnout can be addressed or can, can, can be an issue in everything from high school athletics to college athletics, you know, sports to academics to music you name it, anything. Um, I think burnout, um, uh, I'll address myself first. I, uh, I have not ever really felt burnt out. I think burnt out means subjectively that you're it, exactly what it sounds like. You're just tired. You're just tired of, of the work. You feel either overloaded um, unsuccessful at it. Um, and it's just that it, it, it goes from being difficult to just being an all out grind with no finish line, a marathon with no finish line. And I've never experienced that. Now, have I experienced days and weeks or months or stretches of time where I'm exhausted from work? Yes. Exhausted is not burnout. Um, exhausted exhaustion from work can stem from, from just having too much work to do. Um, there are some days, uh, there's some weeks, um, for example, in my practice, you know, Monday through Friday, standard work week, we take call on the weekends, Saturday and Sunday, I'm in, I'm in-house from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and on Sunday from 7 a.m. to about 5 p.m. That's seven days in a row. The following week, um, Monday through Friday is another five days. In my practice, we work it out so you get what's called a comp day. So you get one day off. Could be random. Could be the Monday. Could be the Friday the following week. Um, I've had I've had weeks where where there's I have no comp day because the following week there's just too many people in my group that are on vacation. So now I'm working seven plus five, 12 days in a row uh, before I have the next weekend off. And on the 10th and 11th and 12th day, that's exhaustion, right? That's, that's just, that's just that's a, that's a lot, especially because being a physician, being a radiologist specifically is a very, it's an academically challenging field. You have to be engaged. We don't want to miss things on the scans we're looking at. You need to be in tune. You need to be focused. It's not, it's not like, you know, sitting there and plugging through an Excel document or watching PowerPoint presentations or going to meetings all day like some people do. You're actively reading scans. Every scan you're reading is, is, you know, is critical to the outcome of a given patient you're seeing. So you can't tune out. Um, and if you find yourself tuning out, you need to take a break. Um, so I've, I've definitely had periods where I've been exhausted. No question about it. How do I deal with that? I'm a tennis player. Um, I'm a, I come from a tennis family. My son competes all the time. He's in a full-time tennis academy. My wife was a state doubles champion when she was in high school. Um, I played... Uh, I was an all, all conference, all area champ in high school, played a lot of USTA from all age divisions, ranked, et cetera. And now I, I'm a member, we're family members of a tennis club, the same club where I grew up, where I grew up. And I actually play tennis about, believe it or not, at the age 41, I will say this, I'm definitely unique in this sense because most of my colleagues do not do things like this. Um, I make time for it. Um, I play tennis about three to four times a week. This past week alone, I played on Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and, and Saturday, and today is Sunday, this morning. 
So playing tennis, staying engaged with life. Tennis is also a social thing. So um, you can combat exhaustion. You can combat burnout by, by, by keeping yourself engaged in life. And I think that's really, really important. Everyone goes about it a different way. I have friends that run. I have friends that mountain climb, friends that ski, whatever it is, like to read. You need to find something. You need to find other things in life that you can apply yourself to wholeheartedly where you're completely distracted from your work and you're not thinking about it. When I play tennis, I'm not a father. I'm not a, I'm not a husband. I'm not a neuroradiologist. Um, I might as well be playing a tournament, boys 18s, competing, playing best of three sets with another friend of mine who could be in finance. So we're not talking about work because he's in finance and I'm a physician and we're there to play tennis. And I'm completely disengaged from everything else at that point in time while I'm playing. And I think that's really important to being able to sort of hit that reset button. So, so I think uh, that's a little bit more than you asked me, but no, I have not felt burnout. Um, B, I have felt exhausted at times, but C, most importantly, I think combating exhaustion means, means taking care of yourself, um, entertaining your hobbies, not putting your life on hold, um, and, and kind of living life as completely as you can. Um, all right, I think that's all the questions we have. Thank you so much. I know we all learned a ton from this and um, we thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you, doctor. Um, you gave some really great advice about being intellectually curious and being open to new experiences, even if you don't have interest in them. And that really like, like as a undergrad who's like looking for research opportunities on campus, um, not necessarily finding exactly what I'm looking for, but understanding that even if I find something that I'm not exactly looking for, I can still learn a lot and grow from it. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. I'll, I'll leave you if, you, if I have a few minutes, can I, can I just give you one parting thought? For sure. Absolutely. Of course. So I read a lot of articles um, outside of medicine, um, business news, entrepreneurial news, and um, I came across an article um, discussing Elon Musk, um, you know, the founder of Tesla. And, you know, he's a genius. He's a brilliant man, maybe crazy, but there's a lot to learn from him. And I, I, the, the article focused on how he hires new people to work, whether in his spacecraft or whatever space company he's got, SpaceX or within Tesla. And I think something to the effect of, he basically said, um, if you're applying for a job, outline um, some difficulties that you've had and how you've solved them specifically. Like very concrete, not where you went to school, not what you get on this test, but what are some difficulties that you faced? Now, these are obviously very specific difficulties of the world of engineering and the world that the kind of people that he's hiring, but what are, what are, what are, how, what, what are some problems that you've encountered and, and how, have you, how have you solved them? And I think, I think that's a really difficult question because now he's asking people who are potentially seeking a position in his companies um, to, to one, acknowledge that they face such difficulties, which some people are, are a little remiss to admit, um, B, what they did and what they did specifically and if they solved the problem. And, and I think that's something that is really powerful because life is all about problem solving. And you guys are pre-med now. And like I said, take all the experience you can get. Um, and, and in the back of your mind, I think we live in a really interesting time now. Fortunately, um, you know, failures and missteps, these, these things are, are no longer, um, they're no longer uh, taboo subjects. People come on TV, they talk about it in articles and interviews of where they, of where they screwed up, where they failed, what went wrong. You know, um, Bill Ackman, he's the, uh, he's the founder and, um, and CEO of, of if, I'm not, if, I'm not, if I'm not wrong here, Pershing Square Capital, probably one of the most important and successful investment companies, investment banks in the world. And, you know, he talks about this. He talked about this in an interview at Oxford where, you know, learning from failure, I mean, to become successful, sometimes it's not the, the fourth or the fifth. It could be the 10th or the 12th or the 20th um, uh, 
path you uh, uh, situation where you where where you where you found success, but it's not that the others were failures per se. You just figured out what didn't work, and I think that as pre meds, you will you will encounter these kinds of situations time and time again. Um, maybe you take maybe you take a class, uh, organic chemistry two or physics one. You don't do so well, um, and you had a plan of knocking out physics your junior year and spending a summer doing X, Y, and Z. And now the, the plan is ruined because you've got to retake the physics class and your summer project is, is on the back burner. What do you do? You know, I'm not saying that these things aren't scary in the moment, but just know that when you get to the point where, assuming you go to medical school, you go through residency, become a physician, you will, you will meet so many people if you sit and talk to them um, that have had insanely circuitous paths. And you'll look back and you'll be like, oh my God, I remember when I was a such and such freshman, I had this situation. I thought the world was over. I thought I was never going to get into medical school. Or I thought my chances of such and such were destroyed. And you'll realize like that the key thing, the key, the key ingredient that pretty much everyone that's successful has is that they, that they bounced back. They've got back on the wagon. They kind of figured it out. Maybe they fell off, they got off the racetrack, but they took a shortcut or they did this or they did that and, and, and they were resourceful and just bounced back. And uh, Sam, we had spoken about this, but for a very short period of time, uh, I had spent a little bit of time working with the admissions office in my, in my fourth year of medical school. And, um, and I'll tell you, I think one of the most important things, things that, I, that I pass on to pre-meds now um, is, that, is, is that you'll... You, you you'll have missteps along the way. You just expect it. Know what's going to happen. And and being a successful physician um, is not about not have is not about not making mistakes. There are days where my wife and I go to work, and despite the best of our intentions and the best of our knowledge, patients are just too sick for us. There's they're not they're, there may not be good outcomes, and it's not necessarily our fault. That's just the nature of the beast. That's that can be that can be very overwhelming for some people. Um, to feel like you're a less than effective physician, right? These are people's lives we're talking about. Um, so how do you handle that emotionally? You can't just quit, right? Physicians get sued um, from time to time. It happens. If you don't, there's a saying in medicine, if you haven't been sued, you haven't been practicing long enough. Um, so how do you deal with a lawsuit? Lawsuits can be extremely heavy. I don't want you thinking about that in college right now, but my point to you is how does one get to the point where they can get handed a lawsuit on a Monday and lawsuits can drag on for years and still continue doing what they're doing and taking care of patients. How can an ER doctor like my wife have a patient that expires or passes away from, you know, a terrible condition in the emergency room at two o'clock in the morning, a heart attack or a ruptured brain aneurysm, whatever, and then go and see the next patient in the next room um, that may have knee pain. How, how do you do that? You have to be able to sort of clear your mind kind of hit the reset button, process it, not suppress it, process it, and kind of move on. And you develop that resilience over the course of time. I think one of the most important elements of being a pre-med, pre-meds often complain about, oh, these classes are too hard, we have to do all this, we have to do all that. It's really training. It's basically training for the ultimate fight. It's training for, for being where, where I am today, where physicians are when they're practicing medicine. Um, you develop that resilience through experience. Um, so that's my, that's my final parting word for you guys. Uh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's an honor. Um, and, um, I wish you the best in all of your endeavors. And I hope this podcast is successful. I hope as many pre-meds as possible hear what I have to say, as well as what all the other physicians you interview have to say, because I'm sure you'll have some very interesting, interesting discussions. Thanks again. Thank you so Thanks much. Again. You're welcome. Okay, bye.